All right, I think I'm ready. Welcome again, everybody, to our uh, continuing webinar series. We're going with uh, what's wrong, basic solar systems. I'm going to show you some options for piping systems. What what kind of got me going on this uh, this topic this time is, I, like I said, I get a lot of drawings sent to me, and it just seems that there's a common theme in a couple. There's only maybe a handful of things that guys aren't quite clear on. Certainly the beginners are struggling a little bit with uh, components, where to put them, and, and why, and how to set up the system with the expansion tank and things. So we're just going to go through all that from the, the top to bottom again. So without any further ado, let's get rolling here. So as always, this is our website. Over here on the, um, the right-hand column, if you go to Calafi.us, you'll see where we're, we're storing, where we're archiving these webinars. So sometimes it takes us a couple days. Last time it took us almost a week to get the one that we did loaded on. So bear with us there as far as uh, getting them. We don't always get them up instantly. It takes a, a little bit to transfer the technology over to where we keep them on this uh, spot where you can go and view them any time. So that's where you want to go and, uh, and pick up the other ones. Now, this is just half of our website page. When you go to the front page down lower, it shows a lot of our technical brochures and all of our components are on there, too. And uh, you can see up here kind of towards the top center, if you can click on different components there if you want to get brochures or information on the various components. So that's how you use the website. Now, another good webinar, if you have a chance, if you didn't get to it last week, uh, Mary um, did a seminar on how to use our website, which was really good. It shows you how to use all the, the quick features and stuff on it. So if you get a minute sometime and um, you want to learn more about our website and how to drive it, certainly go and review that webinar. So here we go. So basically what we did here is we just did a, a drawing, and it's got about six, at least six. I think every time I post this somewhere, we did a seminar on it here for our reps a couple of weeks ago, and they picked up more than the six uh, uh, problems that we thought we had put in here. So they were pretty uh, pretty smart on that. but. There's a couple of this small um, issues with the way the system's piped that you see on the screen here. And what's happening, I think, is you know when solar uh, first started getting hot in 2008, at least for Calafi, when we uh, entered the market, we came out with a package system. And they did really well when we first came out with them. I think a lot of first-time plumbers and HVAC guys and refrigeration guys that had never done solar, didn't know much about hydronics or piping in general, kind of jumped on those packages. And I think as a learning curve, um, advanced there, they said, well, this is great, but you know, we want to start doing bigger systems or commercial systems, or we want to start putting together our own systems with maybe a, a different solar tank, a different brand they prefer, one they could, they could get locally. So what we're seeing is uh, the kind of the interest in the package has dropped off a little bit. We're selling a ton of components these days, even with this down economy. We're sending, we're sending tanks out, we're sending high call up, believe it or not, we're sending controllers and certainly a lot of the uh, the Calafi components, because what we did with the Calafi components is we made them solar specific so they can work with these high temperatures. So now we're starting to get more drawings coming back into us and say, okay, this is what I want to do, or this is what I've done. In some cases, guys will send me a drawing, okay, I piped it this way, now how do I make it work? How do I set up the, uh, you know, the, the pressure and the controller and stuff like that? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start a little basic here, but as we roll along, we'll get into some uh, some more advanced stuff on uh, sizing different components and how and why. So. In this picture here, you'll notice about six um, six mistakes. And what I'll do is I'll go through every one of them first on slides here. I'll probably bounce back every now and then just to uh, to get the big picture here. But the first one is the pump on the on the flow. What you want to do on it, and here's the the mistake drawing. You can see where they've got the circulator, the pump located, and they've got it on the um, coming down from the collector. Now there's a couple issues with that is the temperature, first of all. If a collector sits on the roof and let's say you have a power outage or the controller or something uh, shuts off for a while and that collector just sits up there in the sun and just what we call stagnates, well, the temp temperature in that collector can go over 300 degrees. In fact, I've recorded the one here at my shop at 340, 350 degrees when it just sits up there full of fluid. So um, what you don't want is you don't want that slug of hot fluid when that pump kicks on coming back to the pump because that certainly exceeds the limit on those pumps are rated. Even our solar pumps are rated about 225F. Now, certainly they can take a blast now and then, but you don't want that to be happening on a, a regular basis. That's not uh, not healthy for the pump. So we li like to see the pump pumping up to the collector. Cause now look at it here. It's in the coolest flow in the system because the hot water is going to come down from the collector. It's going to go through your heat exchanger, through your tank, if you have a coil in your tank. It'll lose its heat going through there, and then by the time it gets to the pump, it's lost as much heat as it can exchange in the tank. So this pump's going to run at a much lower temperature over here on this side. So that was one issue. And again, it has to do with the temperature the pumps can operate at. And knowing that all systems at some point, a closed-loop system is going to stagnate. It just, there's not a lot you can do about that, a power outage or a component failure or something like that. It's going to happen, so you might as well uh, plan accordingly and uh, protect yourself and certainly your customers have, from having expensive callbacks. So that's the first one, is the location of the pump. 
The next thing we wanted to show you is the location of the sensor. Let me jump back to on this first drawing. You can see we've got the sensor up on the array, up on the collector right here. In this drawing, it shows it on the bottom of the collector. Well, again, that's the cold side of the collector because the fluid is coming from the tank being pumped up through the collector. So that's not going to read exactly what's going on inside that collector there. So the sensor really needs to be up at the hottest point in the array, which is obviously on the discharge piping or up on the, on the uh, collector near the top there. Now what we've done is a couple things to help you with that. Number one, we've got some fittings that you can uh, you can buy them. They come with our kit, or you can buy them individually. We make them in a lot of different sizes for um, a different type of thread. We make these in uh, oh like 15 millimeter for like evacuated tube size headers and a bunch of different sizes. So we've got this cross fitting that's available, and it's got a little well right in the, in this case the wells in the bottom. We can put the well on the side here. Um, it's just a three-quarter MPT well that goes in there. So what that does is it gets the, the sensor at the high point on the uh, on the collector here, and it's in the fluid instead of just strapping it on the outside of the pipe like we did for years and put a hose clamp and some insulation. Now we've actually got it in the fluid, so it's going to read a little bit better temperature. Also what we started doing on our collectors, now all of our collectors are going out. There's probably still some of the old version in the system, but all of our collectors now have a sensor well that's actually been raised right onto the header pipe. It's a piece of copper tubing that our sensor fits uh, snugly into, and it goes inside the box. So now we're under the glass. We're against the tube that has the fluid in it. So that's probably even nicer than having it on the outside here. It certainly cleans up the look of the collector by having it in the collector box instead of just on the, uh, on the fitting on the outside. So now this really wouldn't need to be a cross fitting there. That could be a T if you're still going to use the vent. Or, you know, some guys prefer not to have the vent up there, and you could put an elbow on here. We offer all those fittings, really, so you can... Uh, you know, pick the one that you like or which works best for you. I got a, uh, an old graybeard solar friend up in Montana that does it a little bit differently. He does what he calls a, um, uh, a stagnation sensor, and he just puts a sensor and he tries to get it on the thin tube because he claims he wants to know the temperature in the box more so than the uh, temperature of the fluid or on the header because he said that's a better measure of the radiation. So. Um, I don't know. He swears by it. But anyways, we're giving you the options right now. We're giving you the well. Also, we're giving you two wells on our collector. So if you turn this uh, collector the opposite way, you'll also have a well at the top. So there's wells on uh, two locations on the collector. So depending on which way you flop those collectors when you install them, you'll always have a well at the top. Um, again, these are sensors, pretty typical, all the sensors on the market now. It's a millimeter, I think it's a six millimeter, but it comes out to about a quarter inch. So if you use a piece of tubing that's quarter inch ID, these, two, uh, these uh, sensors fit into it nicely. And the same with our sensor here. Another thing we've got is we sell just the sensor wells. If you have a tank where you want to add an additional sensor, if you want to put a sensor somewhere in your piping and you like to have it in the fluid, which is a good idea, we sell this nice... Uh, uh, plated well here, so it's got again, it's got the compression nut on it here, so it'll, you can see in this picture over here, it locks it against the sensor, so it can't slide out if you put it upside down, like we showed you, you know, in the previous slide on the roof, it's actually facing down. So this little bushing and compression nut um, assures that it's got a nice uh, tight fit in there. So you can buy this well from us, uh, just like this. It's got a three-quarter MPT thread on it, so it'll go in. Most tanks have an additional tapping somewhere near the top storage tanks or uh, solar tanks that you can screw in another sensor well on the top. A lot of guys like to know what the temperature is at the top of the tank because typically the sensor on the solar tank is at the bottom. That's what turns the system on because that's where the cooler water is. But those tanks are going to stratify uh, as, the, as they heat up. And you've got to know what's going on at the top of the tank. You don't want to get up to where you're going to start popping your relief valves. So I know a lot of installers like to have a uh, sensor up near the top of the tank also. So that's what we're giving you here is the, the option to install a sensor anywhere in the system. And as luck would have it, there's a blast from the past where there's no heat wave gauge. I didn't realize that. I just picked a gauge off the shelf this morning to show you that this type of gauge, these uh, little bimetal gauges that you can buy at any plumbing, uh, electrical, or uh, not electrical, HVAC wholesaler, have that, um, well, let's call it a quarter-inch probe on it that'll fit into that well also. In fact, this is the one out in my shop here that I, I uh, stuck in this morning to show you how that well is that you can see at the top of the tank with a bimetal gauge. Or you could stick the sensor all of our controllers have extra sensors available. You could stick a sensor in there and read that temperature right on the solar controller. If you, um, I like a gauge like this because then the homeowner can just walk down to it without having to hit a button on the controller or anything and just at a glance kind of see what they're at. It's got a nice big diameter dial, so it's, uh, it's friendly to aging eyes like mine. So there you have it. That's some, uh, some things on the sensor and the location and the, the options for reading the temperature in your system or in your tank. Um, air vents. 
really at the highest point in the system, which is typically going to be the collector unless you have a ground mount array outside, you want to have a flow type air vent. So that two things it'll do for you. As you're filling up the system the first time, certainly all the air is going to rise up as you start pumping your fluid in. We'll show you here in a minute how you use this fill and purge valve at the bottom. But typically you're forcing your uh, glycol, your fluid in here. And if you have an air vent up here with a float in it, it's going to take care of all the air bubbles that are going up here as you start filling it. Now, obviously, if you have enough pump with enough head, you're going to have enough pump to be able to push that air bubble right back down and get it out here. But I know a lot of guys with small pumps don't have enough uh, fizz or enough oomph to them to get all the air pushing along with the water. So that little vent there, I'll assure that as the water uh, fills up or the fluid fills up, the glycol goes in there, that the air can vent out. Now, some guys, you know, leave them up there and leave them on. Other guys say, well, you know, we've had issues with them at some point leaking out and, then, you know, kind of trickling down the roof, so they'll either shut the um, uh, the cap off on them or we send them out with a, uh, a shutoff valve, a ball valve. Again, it's rated at 360 degrees, so it's a high-temperature ball valve is, is, is the, uh, the float vent. Or it gives you the ability, if you shut off the valve and you want to, just take the vent with you, but leave the valve up there if ever you're going to add onto that array or if you have to go back and do some service work or something, change the glycol out someday, you still have the provision up there to be able to put that, that air vent on there. You know, the air vent on the roof is the same that we're dealing with in hydronic systems. Do you leave them open or do you leave them closed? I prefer to leave them open at least for a couple days after you first start a system for the first time because every time that fluid heats up, it's going to displace a little bit more air or oxygen out of there. So if you leave that open for a couple days, you're going to assure that every bubble that gets up to the top of that collector is going to have a place to vent out. Now we do, as we go along, I'll show you our solar pump station. And that does have the kind of an automatic air purger in it also, but it's not an automatic. You'd have to go and open that thumb screw on that to get the air out. So this gives you the ability to have that auto automatic air removal for at least the, uh, the startup or the first couple of days of running. So um, the air vent, that's the second. Uh, option. And there's a picture of it there. You can see, again, we've got a half-inch ball valve. What's nice about that, it's got a male by female thread, so it'll screw right into that cross-fitting that I showed in the beginning, or a T, or whatever fitting you put up there, so you don't have to have a nipple and have two more connections in it. And then on the other side, the, um, the air vent screws right into it. It is uh, You can temp take it apart and clean it if ever you had something get stuck under here. You can see the top of it comes off, and uh, it's serviceable. Again, you know, if you read quite on the, in the picture there, it's rated 150 PSI and 360 degrees F, as is the ball valve. It's got different Viton um, seals and stuff in it instead of the EPDM that a typical ball valve might have. Flow check valves, that's another issue here. What's going to happen when you have your collector above the tank and you've got a hot tank and a cold collector at night? Well, you're going to thermal siphon some of your heat away, so it's important to have you have check valves on both sides, the supply and the return. Some guys are saying, well, I put a pump in that has a check valve built into it. Is that enough? Well, that'll take care of the one side, but you really need to check on the other side because you can get flow going both ways through a single pipe like that where the, the colder water will drop down to the center and the hotter water around the outside, and you'll actually get some thermal siphoning even with a single pipe, even if you don't have a complete loop. So just having a check valve on one side isn't enough. Um, I highly recommend a spring check for that because um, some of those just gravity gate ones can pop open from if you have enough buoyancy, if that water's hot enough in that tank. I've seen those things seep through a little bit, so I think a spring check is your better option for that. And of course, once again, it should be rated for that temperature because it's going to see that um, uh, that slug of high temperature after the panel stagnates for a while. So when you pick a uh, check valve, look for one that's rated for the uh, solar temperature. Uh, flow checks, OK. What else we got here? Isolation valves. I mean, there's going to come a point in time where you're going to want to work on something in the system. The pump might go bad, or someday you might have a leak in a coil and have to change this tank. So it's nice to have isolation on both sides. So that gives you the ability to shut this off here and, and service any component down below it. Personally, if you do it like a hydronic system, it's sometimes nice to have a check valve or a, sorry, an isolation valve on both sides of this. Now, with this fill and purge valve, you kind of get that double duty here. We're showing you this to fill and purge the system with the glycol and with the valve up there. Now you've got isolation really close to that pump, so that pump could be serviced or taken out of the um, out of the piping with with a small loss of fluid as you do it, just basically within the volute of that pump and a little bit of piping there. So same thing with the isolation valves. They should really be rated for high temperature on the system like that. Safety relief. Um, that's important on a closed loop glycol system. Same thing there. We should have a, a high temperature valve, a valve that's rated for uh, the solar temperature. 
Um, we have quite an assortment of pressure relief valves. And what I found when I started traveling over, when I first signed on with Coleffi, I, I got to go over to Europe and travel and see some installers and some engineers and a bunch of uh, component manufacturers. And I'm of the opinion, I think they're right over there. They pump their systems up to about 60, 65 PSI in their closed loop glycol systems. And at first I thought, gosh, that's a lot of pressure. What's up with that? Well, I mean, their point is by taking that temp or that pressure up that high, you're raising the boiling point of the glycol. So the glycol that we send out with our system at a 50% mix at, um, I think it's about 59 PSI, boils at 305, 308 degrees, something like that. So now you've raised the potential for that to flash the steam up there. and um, and boil your glycol and stuff. So by keeping them at a higher pressure, it certainly makes air removal a little bit easier. You know, the more pressure you put on an air bubble, the smaller it gets and the easier it is to get around the system and vent out either up here or in the vent if you have our solar pump station with the vent in it. So I'm thinking, you know, we should start looking at putting those systems up to a, a higher fill pressure instead of the typical 15 or 20 pounds we've been doing on uh, hydronic systems. We do have some new components. Uh, we got some new Grunfoss sensors that monitor pressure that can go right in the piping, those little vortex sensors that will me uh, measure temperature and pressure. Um, some guys are putting on those in their systems for an alarm. Certainly on a commercial system, you want to know if there's been a loss of fluid in the, in the system somewhere. If somebody uh, poked a hole in the system or you developed a leak somewhere, you want to be able to know that and you want to be able to shut it off if you have a big expensive pump on there. You certainly don't want to uh, run that pump dry of fluid. So that's where they're starting to use those little pressure sensors to either um, give you an alarm or even drop the system off when the pressure drops down below a certain, uh, certain point. You'll see those in our catalog now. We've got both the flow and the pressure sensors available. And there's our relief valve. Again, we show a bunch of different pressures. You'll notice the one that comes on our system is a um, this one right here. It's actually 87, I think, is what the conversion is. It's a six bar, which comes out to about 87 PSI. And again, I wondered when the, we first started getting those pump stations in why they're shipping with such a high um, pressure relief valve. And that's the reason, because they're pumping them up to 60 pounds. So now they've got one and a half times their fill pressure as a relief pressure. So that's how they end up with the 60, 65 fill with a 90-pound uh, uh, relief valve. And we do, I think that um, this one here goes all the way up to uh, 8 and 10 bars. So you've got a 120 and 150 PSI relief valve. Um, really, everything in the system could be rated for that. I mean, the collectors are tested at, our collectors are tested at 300 pounds hydrostatic test now. Um, everything else in the system is really rated to handle that. I don't know that you'd ever want to go up that high on purpose, but uh, it certainly gives you a little bit extra protection room. We did have one issue on that when we started sending out those high relief valve pressures. As one inspector said, well, you've got a lot more pressure in your, in your uh, solar glycol system than you do in your potable water, so if you have a leak in your glycol, it's going to push into the tank. Well, I guess theoretically that's that's possible, but again, these systems in a, a typical residential application are holding what five or six, maybe seven gallons of glycol. So if that got into an 80 or 120 gallon tank, and it's a non-toxic glycol to begin with, we didn't see it as a big issue. But we did have to send out some lower uh, pressure valves to a couple jobs because the inspectors just were uncomfortable with the the relief on the solar being higher than the relief on the uh, or the pressure in the water system of the of the job. Um, what else have we got here? Again, 360 degree, 50% glycol rating on that, and there's the uh, discharge capacity on that. So it's a pretty, uh, you can see it's a, a three-quarter discharge uh, port on it, so it's got a pretty high rating on the uh, the discharge capacity on that. It's 171,000 BTUs. So that'll, that'll handle a lot of collectors with that valve. I know some engineers, we did a system down in Mississippi, and the engineer down there still prefer, pre prefers to have a, a relief valve on the array outside. So in addition to the one inside on the on the pump station, he had the, you put a couple of these on the on the different banks of arrays out in the yard. Uh, well, there it is. There's a uh, pressure chart for the glycol that we saw, and I imagine it's similar in other brands. You can see up here the percentage of glycol mix. I would say somewhere between 40 and 50 is probably pretty typical on a, on a good brand of glycol for a mix. And then you can see down in the center here is the pressure. So what was I saying a minute ago? It's 60 pounds. Well, you've got to kind of interpolate here a little bit. It falls between two of them, but it's up around between, well, between 300 and 310 degree uh, boiling point when you keep the pressure up that high. Now that does bring in some issues with the expansion tank, which we'll get to here in a minute on how you uh, pressurize and size and install that. So well, here we are, the expansion tank. That was another thing on the drawing. Now um, we've been taught for years from the hydronic side, from Hohan and Gil Carlson and all those people that you always want to pump away from the expansion tank, the point of no pressure um, 
change in the system, so the tie-in should really go here before the pump. Now, there's going to be a little quandary in that. I mean, we're telling you if you're going to build a system from components like this, put it there. You'll notice when we get to our pump station a little bit later that the pump is on the other side, but there's a good reason for that, and I'm going to cover that because we've been called on that a couple times. How come you're pumping towards the expansion tank? But the thing you got to know about expansion tank is the sizing on them, and it's quite a bit different than sizing the hydronic expansion tank. And I've been learning more and more about this as I go along here. But there's two things you've got to keep in mind with a solar expansion tank is you've got a, a much wider delta T. Rarely you're going to see a hydronic system go below zero, maybe a little bit on a snowmelt loop. But you're looking at a solar system that's got the potential to go from zero or even below that temperature. Certainly up in Wisconsin and Minnesota, we get down below that temperature to maybe 150, 200 degrees or hotter if it stagnates in the uh, in the sun, even in the winter time. So you've got to have an expansion tank that can handle that wide of a delta T, which is a big delta T from zero to you know 200 degrees, 203 delta T. So it's a lot more than you're going to typically see in a uh, like a closed loop hydronic system. The other thing that you got to be concerned with when you size an expansion tank in the solar is what if this does flash to steam here? Say you don't have enough pressure to suppress that, or you've got a low glycol percentage, or some guys are putting water still in their in their systems. You've got to be able to handle the expansion of that when that flashes from water to steam. Now you've got a lot more uh, capacity, a lot more expansion volume that you have to take up in that tank. So you're going to notice that in the sizing formula that we have in our hydronics issue, it actually wants you to calculate the, the fluid volume in this collector and this piping that could be exposed to that steam. And then that capacity gets um, formulated in the expansion tank. Now, the whole system, the water in the tank and all this down here isn't going to flash to steam. So that's why we're asking you for the glyco or the glycol or fluid capacity of the collector in that formula. So we're going to figure the steam uh, volume of just this part of the system if it flashed to steam, not the whole thing. And what you're going to find, I ran a little calculation the other day on a system that had 90 gallons of solar fluid in it and required a 40-gallon expansion tank. It was a collector that held quite a bit of fluid. I think they held a gallon and a half per collector. It had quite a few collectors, obviously, with 90 gallons of fluid. And it was a big tank. I mean, that's the size of a typical water heater just as an expansion tank. And that's the reason for it. It's got to be able to handle that uh, a much bigger volume of expansion. The other thing on expansion tanks, and I learned this lesson last year a couple times, is we had some of our customers come and say, gosh, I get up in the morning, cold winter morning, and I go down and I've got zero pressure on my gauge. You know, I, I know it's holding. It's been holding all summer. It's been working fine. How come my, my pressure? Well, you've got to have enough fluid in your expansion tank to be able to handle as a temperature drop what happens to the volume in your system. Well, it decreases just as it does the increase when it gets hotter, when it flashes the steam. So you want to, when you fill your glycol into your system, you want to make sure enough goes into the tank that can handle that, uh, let's call it the contraction of the fluid as it gets colder outside. If you fill it on a day when it's 60 degrees down in the mechanical room or the fluid you're putting in your system is 60 degrees and it gets down to zero come winter, well, you've got to have enough fluid in that tank to be able to handle that. And there is actually is a formula for that, too, that uh, the capacity of the tank based on the capacity of the system, how much you want to make sure you have in your tank to be able to handle that cold side um, pressure as well as the um, expansion on the high side. So that's all in the formula that we have in our hydronics. I think it's in hydronics 3. We've got the tank sizing formula. And um, look that over. And I, you're going to have a shocker when you start looking at those bigger systems and the amount of expansion uh, room that you need to be able to handle all these conditions, which you really want to design for all those conditions. Certainly it's not going to happen on a daily basis that that's, that system could uh, flash to steam. But if it happens once and you open a relief valve and blow out a 20, 30 gallons worth of glycol, that's going to be an expensive callback. So um, you can prevent that just by making sure you get that expansion tank sized right. I'm of the opinion, too, on these our pressure relief valves that you put on the system. You should really put the discharge tube into a tank or something that you can, if it does discharge for whatever reason, that you can capture the fluid. I know on the small residential systems, I typically just use the five-gallon bucket that the fluid came in and just put the, um, the relief tube down in that. So if something did pop, at least it's not all going down in the the floor drain around on the floor or something like that. So there's a couple things to keep in mind about um, solar expansion tanks for systems. So certainly the same thing applies on the, on the pressurization of that. If you're going to fill your system up to 60 pounds, well, then you've got to take the cap off the ex expansion tank and precharge that to that same pressure. Now, you'll notice if you're buying the Cluffy solar tanks, and if you've ever gotten one and taken the stem off and put a gauge on, they come with about 70 pounds of pressure as a precharge already in them because, again, that's made over in Europe, and they're just assuming that these guys are going to be pumping those systems up to 60 pounds. So they come uh, filled with nitrogen, not just air, so it doesn't go through the EPM bladders like oxygen will. So 
by coming with that high pre, uh, pre-charge, you can just lower it down to that 60 pounds or whatever you're going to use. Instead of having to add air to it, we'd prefer to have nitrogen in there. So by coming with the high pressure, you can just bump it down a little bit. So that's what I know about expansion tanks as of today, anyways. I'm hoping to learn more as we go here. You know, at some point, we get to where a drain back system starts to look a little bit better on some of those large systems also. But we'll talk about that in another uh, webinar on just specifically uh, drain back systems. But here's some of the components that we offer for our expansion tank, the different sizes that we offer, as well as the connection kits. Um, our tanks do come with a um, oh, tank looks like it's upside down. I think that's the air side of it, and that's the uh, the threaded side. But our tanks do come with a um, uh, a BSP thread out. That's not a tapered pipe thread. So what we do is we have these different adapters that have a union out, which is kind of nice to have a union out if you ever have to remove it. And it gets sealed with a green gasket on the end, just like all the other fittings on our pump station and our collectors and everything else. So this green gasket, I know people aren't used to gasket of connections on expansion tanks, but once you do get used to them, it really is a nice fitting because, again, it gives you a union. It gives you the same green gasket that fits all the other connections in the system, like our solar flex connections use that same gasket as well as the uh, fittings on the pump station. So keep a stash of these gaskets in your toolbox or something if you're working on these systems. Cause, and other brands are doing it, too. This is a very common uh, a connection over in, in Europe, and certainly a lot of that equipment's coming over here with those gaskets. But So we give you this nice little wall mount bracket, and we give you these little flex whips to go up to the pump station. We've got a, um, a longer size of those available now, so you can move this tank about six feet away from the, um, the connection on the pump station. And then we give you a couple different options here. If you want to, if you don't want to use the flex and you want to use copper pipe or you want a threaded connection there, you can see we give you a, a half-inch MPT or half-inch sweat uh, connection on this little adapter here to go onto our tanks. These tanks are built with a little different bladder in them, so they will handle higher temperature than typical hydronic system. And the other thing is ours is a, um, there's a couple different ways they can make expansion tanks. Some of them will put what's called a, a bag or a bladder type where the, the fluid actually goes into the bag here. Ours has a steel tank with it. You can see where the crimp joint is here with the bladder in it. So when the fluid goes into this tank and it expands in there, it's actually touching the steel tank, the metal. And the thing about that on the solar tank is now it's got the ability to give off some of the heat because what it's going to force into that tank is typically when you have an overheating condition. So it's kind of acting as a little heat dissipator by putting the fluid in the steel tank instead of in the bag that's kind of uh, insulated away from the wall of the tubing because you got air around that sac type of membrane on that other type. So this really is a nice uh, expansion tank to be using for solar because of the higher temperature and because of the design where the, uh, the steel can help you dissipate some of the heat. And you can see we do offer different sizes on the tanks. The larger um, sizes will have a, a base mount. They have a little foot on them so they can just sit on the ground instead of hanging off the bracket here. So we give you a lot of different uh, options on that. Now, certainly, if you're going to get into a bigger commercial job, you might want to look at a, a tank size that are built just for that application. But you can gang these together. I mean, you could put a couple of tanks on, the, uh, on one system and just tee them together. You just got to make sure that you have the pre-charge uh, pressure set the same on all of them so they can work, uh, work in harmony. Let's see, what else on expansion tanks? Also on our expansion tank <coughs> excuse me, kit, we've got a double check valve here, which is kind of unique. What it does is it's got a check valve that um, checks the fluid in the tank. So if ever you had a tank go bad and the membrane ruptured and you had to take it out and it was full of fluid, well, the check valve holds the fluid in the tank. And then there's a second check here that holds the fluid into the system. So you break this union in the center. I don't know if I've got a bigger picture of that. You break it apart here, and now you can take this tank outside or out in the uh, at your shop or something before you unscrew it, and you don't spray glycol all over the place. And also, it keeps all the glycol in the system, so it's a nice, uh, it's a handy valve. And I was confused at first. I said, well, how can you have two check valves? How does that work? Well, what happens when you screw the tank into the check valve? The end of that nipple on the tank actually pushes the check valve open, so that's how it's able to get the fluid, the fluid in and out of the tank. You can't have a check valve where the fluid only goes one way into the tank, and that's what happens is the uh, the little nipple on the tank actually pushes the check valve open. So when you take them apart to service them, you got to break them at the union. Don't unscrew the tank from the thread here. You still have the same issue that you had before you had the check valve on it. You break, which is pretty obvious. It's got a nice big brass union there that you break apart, and uh, and you can remove that tank without losing any fluid from either side of the system from the tank. Ah, there's a better shot of it. I thought I did. Again, over here in the right-hand corner, you can see the gasket connection. Uh, there's our union connection if you want to go to sweat or um, half-inch threaded. And there's that union I was talking about. So you've got one check valve down here, and you've got one check valve up there. This little fitting, which is kind of nice, it's even got a flat side that it fits into this bracket. So you can actually wrench on this once you slide it in there because it's kind of, it, um, it keeps it from spinning. 
and also, of course, it captivates it in there, so it holds it on the uh, on the bracket. Um, it's a nice bracket. It's really heavy metal, and also it's uh, got an anodized finish on it too, so it doesn't rust away on you. Uh, what else on that? I think I covered that. Temperature gauges. It's certainly important to know what's going on in the system. I like to see a temperature gauge on the supply and return. Um, you know, on the pump stations, they come in different color. I think they're blue and red, so you can read the, the supply and return temperature on that. A lot of the controllers now have the ability to read the temperature there, too. They'll have, if you have an extra sensor allotted on the controller, certainly you could put a, you know, a sensor and just read that temperature right on the controller. But I like, like I showed earlier, those nice, gosh, that bimetal gauge from Heatway must be 30 years old. It has the Heatway name on it, and it still works fine. So there's uh, something to be said for a, the basic, simple bimetal temperature gauge for as far as and longevity on a valve like that. And again, we gave you the wells. If you want to build your own T here, you can get it. You can actually buy it, uh, um, T's that have a FIP uh, branch thread, so you can thread that well that I showed you earlier right in the side of the T, or certainly make up your own fitting for that. Temperature gauges uh, they help you for troubleshooting. Certainly show you what's the, what's going on with the system, the performance of delta T um, through your system as your as your system's running. And um, also to assure that you got flow through the system when you first kick that on, you better watch that temperature gauge up, come up, or you, you're not. Uh, you got an air bubble or something trapped in there, and you're not flowing through it. So, a um, couple good reasons to consider temperature gauges. Flow meters, um, adjustable flow meters, of course. You want to on different uh, rays and different type of collectors. The manufacturer will specify, a, a, you know, an accepted uh, flow rate through that. I know SRCC has some numbers on that that they test them at. So to get the maximum performance out of a collector rate, depending if you have one, two, three, what type of collectors you have, you really want to be able to adjust the flow rate going through there. You don't necessarily want to put a pump in here, put it on high speed and just let it go. You want to be able to tune that in. So having a, uh, a flow meter that's adjustable is another nice thing. And there's, uh, we offer a couple different options for that from Calefi, but that's basically right there. Um, <clears throat> You should be able to read the, the fluid in there and also be able to adjust it. But it's nice to have one, and I'm going to show you a nice one that we offer, that doesn't cloud up in there. So if you come back a couple years later and you want to check the flow rate or you want to make sure your pump's on the right speed or let's say you're going to add some collectors and you've got to change the flow rate through it, it's certainly nice to have a, uh, a flow setter in there that you can use over and over again without having to uh, take the glass out of it and clean it off. So. The other thing it does, it lets you see what's going on with the fluid in there. Because what happens with glyco when it gets cooked and uh, overheated a bunch, it starts to turn kind of a oh, an ugly brown, almost a coffee color when it goes really bad. So if you have a window type site um, flow setter in here, you know when you go back on your yearly checks or every couple years when you go back and check out the system for the homeowner, you can just look in there and see um, that's going to be an indicator. If you see that your fluid's turned brown or a dark color, you know that the system's been overheating and the glyco's been. Uh, uh, shocked quite a bit, and it's time to figure out, number one, why it's doing that. Maybe they're not using enough hot water, or you've got too big of an array for the tank capacity, or something's going on that um, the glycol is being uh, fried and overheated and changing color on it. So it, it's kind of a multi-purpose device there to be able to, to see all those things. And here's a, one that we offer. It comes in the solar pump stations. We also sell it as an individual component, and we've got a couple different choices for um, fittings that we can put on it for you. You can just specify what you want here for a, a union connection. Again, that's a straight thread with a gasket of connection, so you can slip this thing in and out. Um, it reads um, the flow rate here with a little floating uh, ball floats in there. And uh, there's the adjustment screw to set the flow. We've got a couple different styles here. This one, you can set the flow with the um, uh, just a screw slot there. And the same thing on this one, a little bit smaller slot here. And we've got a couple different uh, sizes of them, different flow rates in the window here, depending on how big a system. Certainly, if you're going to flow on a one-inch system, you might want a, a higher flow rate. So we offer a couple different versions of that. Um, and then we offer this one here is a new product for us, new here in, in the U.S. anyways. We've had this over in Europe for a while, and we've decided to bring it in here. But this is kind of a nice, uh, we call it the hand grenade, because it's got a little ring like a hand grenade. What's nice about this one is that the um, you pull this pin to set the fluid, and it diverts the fluid through here. And back into the thing, there's your flow setter. Uh, um, I don't know if that's got a screw slot. I think you've got to use like a crescent wrench or something on there. It's just got a flat side that you can set your flow rate. And then after you get it set, you release the pin. And now the fluid no longer goes through here. It goes straight, straight through it. But the other thing that's unique about this, when you pull this pin, the fluid goes through here. It moves a little float. And it's actually got a little magnet on the float 
I don't know if you can see it in this picture, but there's a steel ball in there. So the magnet moves the ball so the fluid doesn't actually go through the window on this one. So that window is always going to stay clear in that. So if you have to go back and use that and change it, it's never going to fog up. Now, I guess the downside of that is the fluid. You can't look at the fluid through the window like you could on the one I showed you previously. But it is a nice little uh, flow setter. We offer that in about, I think, up to inch and a half now, from half inch up to inch and a half. So it covers a lot of ranges. Uh, that's available in the catalog now. Fill and purge placement. Now that's pretty important. You want to have a, um, a method to push the glycol in the system and push the air out ahead of it, and you want to make sure that fluid's going through all the piping in the system. So we offer a valve that you can do that in one component here where it's got a ball valve shut off in the center and it's got the two hose connections. So in this case here, you'd shut off the valve, uh, pump your fluid in here, pump it up. It's going to go through the pump, going to push the check valve open, go up through the system, obviously around through the collector. Whatever little air pushes ahead of it, whatever this valve, this vent up here can handle as it's going through there, it'll get vented out as you're filling it, and the rest of the air will be pushed down through the coil in the tank, and then you can just burp it out here. The other thing that's nice about a valve like this where you have these full port um, hose bibs is that if there's any debris in the system from piping it, maybe your installers, you know, are using copper pipe and they drag it through the insulation up in an attic and you've got some, you know, fiberglass or cellulose or some kind of insulation or you've got some solder balls in there from somebody soldering this, by having a full port valve like this, if you put a, um, you could even put a garden hose and put water through it and flush it out first, you can get a really good flow through that and, and blast out any dirt or debris that might be um, in your piping or in your tank or from your solder joints or anything like that. So certainly the less connections and joints you have on the system, the, the better it is for leak potential. So by building this all in one component here, we give you the shut off. So you've got the isolation for this side of the pump if you want and your fill and purge all in one, uh, in one component. The other thing that's nice about putting it down here, I like to put it down here because if ever you had to drain the glycol of the system, if you wanted to work on it or the tank had to be replaced or something, by putting it down like this, now you've got the lowest point in your system is right here at this um, fill and purge valve. So you could drain the system completely down to work on it and, like I said, use that for one side of the isolation on your pump. You know, another thing here I just thought about, this. Um, if you use this little flow setter here with the shutoff in it, you've actually got isolation on both sides of that um, pump with the, uh, the valve up here and the, uh, the shutoff screw and the, uh, the flow setter, too. So really, you have three points of isolation in this system. Um, and the other thing you do with a system like that is, you know, once a year, it's nice to go back to all your customers once a year and check their systems. It's just a nice courtesy call, but also it's a good uh, time to check the fluid and make sure that that fluid, if the pH of that fluid is dropping every time you go back and uh, check it, again, that's telling you that you've got probably some overheating issues, and it's a good way to catch it. And by having this down here, you just take a little cup with you, open it up, put some in a cup. I like to use one of those clear plastic cups so you can look at it. You can smell a little bit of it, like you smell a nice wine. <laughs> and uh, you'll tell, you'll know what a burned glycol smells like. It's a pretty ugly smell. But you can look at it. You can see the color of it. And then also take your pH meter and your uh, refractometer so you can get your uh, freeze protection rate. You know, just acknowledge that that's still good. And also check the pH on the fluid. As the pH drops, it's telling you there's something going on in that system. Now, there's the valve that we offer is a fill and purge valve. It's a one-piece uh, one valve. And the same thing here. We can give you different size fittings to go on that. There's a one-inch fitting there, three-quarter, same thing. You've got the straight connection there with the, um, with the gasketed connection. So you can, what's nice to do with these is you can solder it onto your piping and then uh, assemble it so now you're not heating on your valve. So by having these union connections, just like you install a water heater or something where you solder up your unions first and then screw them on, and you're not going to um, overheat the gaskets or the fitting here. So again, a shut off in the center and the two fills here. I know, I know on one of the earlier webinars I explained kind of an issue we had with these. We give you these little caps on them, too, because sometimes the ball valve can drip a little bit after you, you shut them on and off a bunch of times. So we give you these caps with a nice flat rubber washer in there. Well, we had one installer say, well, you know, I'm getting a little drip out of this. And, uh, you know, it shouldn't drip. Shouldn't this valve shut off? Well, we learned something on that valve. What happened on these systems is we looked in there, and you could see the little white Teflon packing had blown out of the edge of that bomb. I said, well, that's odd. And we kind of wrote them off as maybe kind of interesting is when hot fluid comes down and hits the, whenever you shut off a ball, these balls are hollow in the center. So when you shut them off, there's a little bit of fluid that's always trapped in these balls here. And what happened is when they shut it off and they trapped some of the water in that ball where they first uh, flushed the system out and they had water in this ball, well, that hot fluid came down. It actually heated up the water in that, inside that ball and expanded, and it blew the gasket out of the, um, 
of this side of the ball on this little shutoff valve. So what they're doing now on this valve is they're actually drilling a little pinhole in the side of the ball in there. So when this ball is shut off, there's a pinhole that allows the fluid that's inside the ball now to be um, um, exposed to the fluid that's in here. So you can never build up pressure in the ball. So I thought that was a, a clever engineering fix for a, a probably a rare, but certainly a, a problem that did happen to us. So now we've showed you all the different components, where they should be in the system, the reason for putting them there. I mean, another way to go, and certainly we saw a lot of these uh, pre-built pump stations that can take a lot of the labor cost out of a job. It looks nice. They're all insulated. But what we're doing in this system here is we're giving you all the things we just talked about. We're putting them all in the right place. They're all high temperature components, um, and they're in a nice insulated box. So you've got your gauges. You've got your flow setter, your relief valve, your expansion tank connection. Everything is built into there. Oops, I should have put something in there, I guess. Sorry about that. Let's see if I got a better picture of that to show you what's going on here. And I want to explain this expansion tank uh, location a little bit. So coming down on this side, we've got what I call these triple duty valves because they actually serve as the temperature wells for your uh, supply and return temperature on there. There's a check valve in there. There's a spring-loaded check valve in both of uh, these uh, valves up here. And there's also a shutoff valve. I think on the next picture I'll show you a cutaway. I, I just sawed one in half on my bench to show you what happens inside those. So there's your temperature, there's your check valves, there's your isolation coming down here. This is a little air elimination device. It's a fairly simple thing. I think I might have put a picture there. I think I got one of those in half, too, because I didn't understand what was going on in there. It's just basically kind of like the old ramp type that we used on hydronic systems for years, but it's a vertical version of that. So it's got a tube that goes through the center, so the fluid goes up, comes back down around it, and goes up. So it'll trap air in this little canister here. It'll trap quite a bit of air in there. It probably holds a cup's worth of air. And then it's got a manual purge on it. So if you walk away from a system, and you don't get back to another year, it'll actually catch all those little bubbles that you didn't get out the first time. And it'll hold them in here until you can come back and burp them out. And once it traps up inside this chamber here, it can't get back into the fluid stream because of the little tube that's built inside there. So that's kind of a nice little uh, uh, purger in there that'll do its work after you leave. And of course, there's your fill and purge valve. Um, so you fill in the system. There's your uh, flow indicator with the window in it and the shutoff valve there for uh, shutting off that side of the pump or also for um, adjusting the flow rate through there. And of course, there's your pump. Again, all the pump stations come with this union connection, which is very popular in Europe. They don't use many flange connection pumps over there. I know I'm used to the flange bolt connection. But once you've worked with these for a while, it's a very nice way to get a pump in and out of the system. You just loosen those unions. And they're not very tight, because with that gasket in there, they don't have to be uh, cinched down like a tapered thread. So you can loosen these. The unions have enough room to just drop out of the way, and you can actually pull that pump out of there um, without having to get in there with a box wrench and trying to get to those uh, nuts and bolts. Then going up on this side, we've got, again, the, the shutoff valve, the isolation valve, the triple duty valve with the gauge and the check valve. And over here, this is what we call our safety group. And it's a one-piece um, component here that gives you the pressure gauge, your fill pressure gauge with a little lazy hand gauge on it. The, um, the relief valve uh, screws right into it. And your expansion connection, your expansion tank connection is all built into this. So with one threaded connection right here, you get all those components without having to stack a bunch of T's or build that on the job. So it makes a nice thing. But what you're going to notice here is now we're pumping at the expansion tank and away from it. Well, there's a couple reasons for that. Remember earlier I said you'd want to be able to um, have the expansion tank always in the collector loop system. So if somebody was to come in here and shut both these valves off to service the system, maybe it was a hot sunny day or something, and the pump isn't running for a couple minutes, well, your expansion tank is, a, is teed in above the shutoff valves here. So you never isolate this tank on the collector loop. So you can't uh, pop a relief valve by having the pressure in the collector go up and uh, uh, pop this valve. So you always want your, even if you're going to build your own, you want to have this expansion tank above any shutoff valves that somebody could inadvertently uh, shut off or leave off or, or leave off when they're servicing them. And again, you'll notice it's on the return side of the uh, the piping. So the heat's going to come down, go through the tank, and um, dissipate before it gets to the expansion tank. So it's going to see the lowest possible temperature being up here. Now, certainly if a, if a temperature is uh, it's real high in a collector from stagnation. Some of that can push down the piping both directions if the pump isn't running. And it can sit, still see a little slug of hot water in that case. But um, this is the better spot for it. What's on the cool side, it's got to be above the shutoff valves. And just by putting in one component here, we've saved a lot of the, um, the threaded connections and stuff. So again, that's a, a straight thread on there with a gasketed connection. We'll give you different adapters for that if you want to build this out of copper tube. Or we sell these different uh, stainless steel uh, flex connectors for the expansion tank. 
And the other thing nice about this, the expansion tank, this whole safety group is outside of the, um, the foam enclosure. So you can always see this pressure gauge, there's uh, cutouts for the temperature gauges. So the important things that the installer, the homeowner wants to monitor, the temperature and the pressure, are always visible outside of the, um, the foam insulation jacket. And by turning this valve off to the side like we did here, now you can put an adapter in that and take your, um, you know, your blow-off tube down to your, um, your catch basin or down to your, uh, your uh, floor, whatever you're going to do with your relief valve. Let's see if I covered everything. So I got the, um, yeah, I think I've got everything there, the pressure gauge, the flow meter. Again, the valve that comes out on our solar pump station is, a, um, is rated at 87. It's a six-bar pressure relief valve, which is 87 PSI. So that's a very high pressure relief valve. And we can go up to as high as 150 just by unscrewing it here from the connection and replacing that valve. All right, what else on that? So there's a look of uh, two of our pump stations that we offer. There's a dual pump station, and there's a single pump station. You'll notice the difference on this one is there isn't the second line over here. So basically what we've taken out of here is that little air purger, and then we've moved the, um, the other isolation is built into this valve here, so we don't have to have the um, uh, this double fill and purge valve here. We just fill, shut off here, and now we've got the ability to fill and purge. There's your purge, there's your fill, there's your isolation. So we can do it with a single pump station, but you do lose the, um, the little air purger. What these are typically for, if you're going to do like a, a double array system, like you got an east and west array, and you want to have two pumps, what we make now is a kit that has a link. It's got just the right fittings that you can link both these together. So if you're doing an east and west, this is your one pump for the east side, this is the pump for the west side, or vice versa, however you want to pipe them together. But it just gives you a nice way to put two pumps together with um, we give the, the brass crossover links to be able to do it, and they match as far as the, the size and the look of the um, the insulation jacket. Both of them have relief valves on them, so if one's shut off and the other one's running, you've still got relief on the um, on the system and the expansion tank connection and all that is still available on that too. So there's our single pump station. Some guys are buying these and just saying, you know, we're pretty comfortable that we're getting a good purge and getting all our air out when we first fill it. We've got the vent up on the top of the roof. It's a little bit less money, so they're just buying the single pump station. It's the same pump, the same capacity, everything's the same, and it just um, pretty much just eliminates that, um, that air uh, valve in there. There it is. I thought I had a, a look at what's inside that little air elimination device. And there you can see you can you can use either a little key on that. It's got that little um, square flat in it, or it's got a slot in it for a screwdriver. Um, you know, put a rag or a cup or something on it when you blow that off, or it's going to blow over the side of your pump station. But that's how it works. You can see the air bubbles rise up inside the uh, chamber here, and the fluid goes through it. So it's going to be able to trap all this uh, volume of air in this um, thing and not affect the uh, flow going through it. The air is not going to get pulled back into the system by getting trapped up in the, or you can then uh, just blow it off with the, with the little manual air vent on the side That uh, We talked about the ball check valves. This is that 3-in-1 uh, valve that I talked about earlier. i got a cutaway of this coming, too. But this is what happens with that valve. Straight through, it's uh, on the on position here, it's just wide open straight through a full port ball valve. If you turn this valve off at a 45 like this, what happens, it's pretty clever. The ball in here, actually the edge of the ball, the lip of the ball, I'll show that in the cutaway too a little bit better, actually lifts open that spring-loaded check valve in here. So if you had to drain down your collectors, you're going to have to turn this valve at a 45 like this so the check valves can get held open on both sides. Otherwise, you're not going to get the fluid out of your uh, collector array on the top. And of course, if you turn it all the way across here um, like this, it's a, it's a shut-off valve. Let me see. I think i got my picture coming up. There it is, right there. So. I just took one of those again. There's your gauge well, so your gauge can go in there. Actually, I found that you could put our sensor in there, too, if you wanted to use one of our sensors instead of this gauge. It'll fit in, inside there, and it goes into the um, into the fluid stream pretty well there. There you can see that spring-loaded check. Notice it's a brass uh, check valve in there, so it can withstand that high temperature. It's not a rubber uh, seat in there. It's got, I think it's about a half PSI uh, spring tension on it, half pound pop on that uh, check valve. There's your full port ball valve, and there is where you can see when it's Turn it at 45. I broke this one off on the stem, take it apart. But you can see the edge of the uh, the lip of the valve will hold open this check valve, and that's how you drain the system out. So there's your uh, shut up valve, your check valve, and your temperature well all in one component. And it's, again, it's all high temperature uh, rated for the uh, solar temperatures, 350, 360 degree F operating temperature. Oh, what else on that? I think that covered that. There's a look at the uh, safety group I was just talking about. Again, it's got a union connection with a gasket, so this whole thing could be taken off if you ever do any service or want to change something on that. 
pressure gauge with the lazy hand on it, um, the relief valve, and uh, on some versions you'll have your uh, your purge cock on here. On some versions it'll it'll just have the expansion tank and the relief valve on it. Depending if you buy the single or the pump station, that safety group will look a little bit different. Um, and of course we've got the Delta T controllers. Um, our controller actually fits right in the jacket on the front of it. Um, I think we went through some controller webinars earlier. If you want to know, learn more about that, we do have a, a good selection of controllers from a, a basic uh, version 2 iSolar 2 all the way up to now. We've got the BX controller, which has four outputs, and uh, we'll take the ground file sensor. It has a little data logging card slot and stuff on it. Um, we'll be doing more on the data loggers and the, uh, the controls. That, that's one of our most frequent questions is uh, more information on those those controls, and uh, they're getting better all the time, so we'll cover that some more. Um, what else on that? Oh, there's just kind of a look at the ones that we offer, our plus controllers. <clears throat> we do have the new version 2 plus controllers, which has a dump zone feature in it, which is really nice. A range number 10 now in all of our plus controllers version 2 is a dump zone, so you don't have to go in there and configure it anymore. You select arrangement 10, and what it's going to do is charge up your tank, and then if the, it, what it's doing now in arrangement 10, it's watching the collector temperature instead of the tank temperature. So the, the tank is up to set point wherever you set, and if the temperature in the collector gets up to, I think it's factor set at 250 degrees, it's going to open your dump zone, whatever that might be, a, a, a valve or whatever you've got there to go to your dump zone, whether it's a pool or a, a loop outside or a, one of the little convector um, dump zone radiators or something like that. And it's going to run until the collector temperature drops 10 degrees. So now we're not going to lose a bunch of heat. We're just trying to keep that fluid in that collector from exceeding what's comfortable for the glycol. So the new uh, arrangement number 10 dump zone is a pretty nice uh, arrangement to use. And then it's got a drain back function in it now that allows you to choose between either uh, a single pump as a variable speed or a dual pump system, too. So it's, uh, it's got some nice features in that plus controller. Uh, there's kind of our selection right now. We do still have the, uh, the DC controllers for guys that are doing uh, PV-powered systems. And um, the ISOLAR 2, 4, and the PLUS is now the V2, version 2, all the, the ones going out are all version 2 now. Uh, there's a new BX controller I just talked about. This is nice. It's got a little uh, card slot on the side, so you can, uh, it'll keep the data, and you can pull that off and then stick it into your computer or something, use the uh, viewer program, and then you can see, uh, you can pull data off this controller now. A little bit different look on the buttons on as far as operating it, but it's pretty simple, just four through the things in the set button. But it does have a bigger screen on it now, too. It's a little bit larger uh, display, so you can see more of the, uh, uh, the components and the icons and stuff like that. So great little control. I've been playing around with one here on my own system. It does a lot of neat things. This is what it does. It's got 26 arrangements already into it. It's got four relay outputs now. Three of them are triac relays, which means they're speed control, and one's a standard magnetic type of just point type of relay. Um, it's got two pulse width modulation outputs. Now, I don't know that we have pumps over here yet that can take that um, output directly, but the pumps in Europe are actually come that you can put this signal right in them with two wires. So that's available as soon as we get the pumps over here to match it. Seven inputs, it'll take two of those Grundfos uh, vortex sensors, a wire right into it. It's got a little plug right in there. Um, energy saving switch, it's, the display will go off so you're not using any current on that. This is nice. It's got a time control thermostat function in it. So if you want to use it to, to operate a backup element or something like that, it's got a timer in there that, that you can set the time of day that that thing comes on and off. It's a seven-day clock in there now, too. So you can set different programs for different days. Uh, the data logging, uh, drain back, VBUS, of course, like all of them to put uh, remote um, readouts and data loggers and different things into it. Also, I think we're going to hit this just about right. We do also now have some uh, solar discal air separators here, just like our discal that we sell for hydronic systems, but this is a high temperature one. It's got a stainless steel mesh in it, so it's, a, again, 350 degree temperature. Um, we've had them in three quarter. We're getting larger sizes. They'll be coming over soon. Uh, they're already built. We're just waiting for those to come over. So if you want to pump on, certainly on larger systems, it's a good idea to use a, a discal type air remover, because this will really get micro bubbles out of the system by having that that screen or that median there, it'll collect all those little bubbles. So it's a certainly more, uh, uh, what would be a good word, robust uh, air eliminator than just a bucket vent up on the top or that little air purger that's in the pump station. And we're also going to have sweat versions. Now, all of, so far, all the Cloppy Solar components have come in a plated version. When we get sweat versions of this, it's not going to be plated because, obviously, you burn the plating off if you solder it in. So that will be a brass um, look instead of a plated look on our sweat versions. But it will be still be this high-temperature uh, solar version of it. 
and I think I'm not correction on the line. I think we're going up to inch or inch and a quarter on those. So we'll have from three quarter to uh, inch and a quarter in the uh, solar discal separators. Um, mixing valves. That was probably the other big thing on that on the very first um, drawing that we had. You definitely want to have a good list of mixing valve on the output of your um, solar tank because there's a potential for that tank to get up there pretty hot. If you're using some of the uh, uh, um, collector cooling functions, you're going to overshoot your tank temperature. So uh, you want to make sure this is a valve that can handle those temperatures, that it's listed. We sell one now with a little temperature gauge on it so you know where you've set them or if the inspector wants to know that that valve was dialed and set properly, um, it's got a gauge in there to do that. Oh, there it is right there. So there's our solar again. It's a solar uh, valve plated finish. You can see on it there's the uh, the temperature gauge that uh, just snaps in there. You can pull it off if you want to take it with you. And certainly you can lock it once you get it set. And there's the uh, the temperature um, adjustment table that comes in the installation manual. A um, couple different sizes on that. We've got some high capacity ones available. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, now if you're going to want to switch the electric element with our iSolar controller, you're going to have to put an isolation, really, because it certainly can't uh, switch that amount of current. It can only handle one amp. So if you're going to switch a 4,500-watt element, for example, you're going to need like a 30-amp relay in there. So um, the control can run the relay, and then the relay, of course, can switch the, uh, the higher current draw of the, uh, the element. But now we can run that relay with that timer function that I was telling you about. So if you want to, every morning at you know a certain time, we shut the element off, and then say four or five o'clock at night, it kicks back on. Uh, the control's got the ability to do that. You have to supply this isolation relay between the um, the element and the controller. So now you don't have to buy a special uh, um, electronic or electric uh, timer to be able to do that. All you have to do is buy the relay, which is certainly less money than buying a 240 volt 30 amp uh, uh, timer. All right, we did it. I think we hit that one pretty good as far as timing. Um, enough Rex is on the line. If there's any questions I can answer here quickly, certainly I'll get back to all the, uh, the emails or questions that we can't get to. But um, enough Rex is on the line. If not, I want to thank everybody again for coming. We're going to do a couple more of these uh, fix of uh, things. I think this works pretty good. It gives us the ability to talk about what's coming in as far as questions and show you, you know, what guys are, are, are wondering about and also, uh, you know, bring a little bit of product into the equation, too. On, uh, we'll be doing them on different hydronic topics as we go along here. So as always, we want input. You know, what do you want us to, uh, to do next for webinars? Send, uh, send any